Hi, everyone, and welcome to the post screening discussion for my octopus teacher. My name is Karen McMullen. I'm a New York City based programmer, uh, features programmer at Doc NYC, a program at Tribeca Film Festival, and also the Tide Film Festival. We are here with the wonderful and talented crew for my octopus teacher, executive producer Ellen Windermuth, um, producer Swati Thea Garajan and co-director Pippa Ehrlich. Hi, everybody. Hi, Karen. Karen. Hi, Karen. So, so great to see you. It's so nice to see um, such a female-centric production crew. You know, it's, it's a little rare, rare. I know you have men involved as well, but it's nice to see that it's so heavily female. Um, so let's talk about your amazing film. I know Swati, you have a personal relationship, <laughs> very personal relationship with Craig and, um, and Pippa, you're a good friend as well. Can you guys talk to us about how you came to the story? Um, I think Ellen should start. Yeah, I was just gonna I say. think I have to start because I'm the oldest and I'm also the oldest friend of Craig's. So Craig and I met in uh, 1998. Um, and I worked with him on a film that took him to the Kalahari where he learned tracking from uh, the Sun Bushman. Um, and so that's how long we've been working together for, but that's also the experience that led him to discovering his ability to track underwater animals in My Octopus Teacher. Um, so the story really started, I think Craig's story really started in 1998. Um, and from that moment onwards, he's been driven by nothing more than wanting to be um, in close contact with nature um, and really feel a part of nature. And he's such, I, I don't have to tell you this, but he's a very charismatic man. Um, and in those many, many years of studying nature, he learned so much that he's really been all of our teacher, funnily enough. Um, and so when it came to um, the, the state he was in when the film started, and that's really where Swati, I think, has to pick up because she's married to him, right? But when, when he <laughs> came to be in that state of, of burnout and exhaustion from, you know, having to do so much work for channels that, you know, needed him to be in dangerous surroundings, getting shots, you know, that, that are incredibly hard to get when he was in that state, um, I think, um, was the time the film began. And I think Swati, you might wanna take it up from there because that's where you come in. Yeah. Um, so we moved here to where we live near the ocean about roughly 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And uh, we were in the middle of many, many projects at the time. He'd just come off a series of films on crocodiles. You know, he'd open water dive with big Nile crocodiles in the Okavango. And then he produced three films, um, did a film on a crocodile and a man up, back up in Costa Rica and South America. And we'd worked on a film together. So I think there was a lot over two years that he did. And he just hit like this, yeah, as Ellen said, a complete burnout. And I think, as she said rightly, I think being around all those crocodiles and making those films, you know, when your adrenaline is that high and you have to be that focused and then be a producer on a film and direct it and, 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 um, I think it just became a lot for him and he hit that kind of burnout. And we were here at the time and he really, at the time, didn't feel like he wanted to even make films anymore or even pick up a camera. And um, I think one of the things that always made him calm, made him settled, I said, I guess centered uh, was being out in nature. And uh, it's what he's done since he was a child. He knew the ocean quite well because he's been diving since he was a child. Uh, but having spent that time, as Ellen said, with the San people back in the Kalahari and then doing all the work that he'd done, he just decided to go out into that ocean every day and immerse himself and learn that environment to the best of his ability, um, you know, and just to see if what would come from that. And I think there was tremendous healing that came from that and tremendous learning. And of course, that wonderful year that he had with that wonderful wild octopus, which That's became right. sort of the center of the story. And, um, and that's where Pippa came in. So um, I met Craig uh, and, and Swati later, but 
I was working as a conservation journalist and I was working with scientists and I was writing about the stories of, of people who were spending a lot of time in nature and a lot of time with animals and having these incredible experiences. And I kind of also hit a bit of a wall, I guess, where I realized that uh, I felt like a voyeur, I suppose. Um, and I'd been on a dive with Craig and I'd been already had my mind alone because I saw from that very first dive that, that he was moving through nature in a way that I'd never seen a human being do. He could pick up signs and find animals that I didn't know existed and recognize behaviors and I was just fascinating to me. So I kind of said to him, look, I'm interested in cold thermogenesis, which is the process of adapting your body to the cold, and I'm interested in learning to track. Um, and he said, okay, well, you know, come diving. And eventually my body adapted and six months into that, Craig and I were diving regularly and, and I was learning to track octopus, strangely enough, as, as the first animal that I focused on. Um, and he asked if I wanted to make this film with him. Um, and I was just really, really lucky to be at the right space at the right time. And at that time, I was probably the only person who could stay in the water for, for as long as him with no wetsuit, <laughs> um, you know. And then I was incredibly lucky to have Ellen and Swati uh, just, you know, uh, uh, when you travel, you have all these conversations about filmmaking uh, and you talk about the craft and you talk about creative decisions and you talk about uh, how you did the things that you do. But I think what we don't always talk about in filmmaking is the amount of space holding that has to happen to make a film happen. Mm -hmm. And in addition to Ellen's incredible um, exec producing and Swati's incredible associate producing and all of the creative and, and logical ideas that they put in the whole time. Both of these women like really held Craig and I together for a very long time while we were making this film. And, and yeah, Swati allowed her production, her, her house to become a production company. And yeah, it was crazy. So I'm very, very grateful. Yeah, it was obviously a uh, very serendipitous coming together. So um, you guys are all in the conversation conservation space a bit, and you've worked in various capacities. Swati, you were uh, had a television show, correct? New Delhi TV, I'm yeah. assuming. I mean. Yeah. Um, and Ellen, obviously, you're a big wink in that. What do you think your this film? adds to the conversation about environmental protection and conservative conservative. Um, I think this film um, really shows how, um, how well emotional ecology works. That's a term that sort of came up while making the film and it's something that came up also while it was really mainly the three of us that, that had to talk to Craig about having to be in the film. And if any one of us hadn't pushed for it, he really did not want to be in this film. He thought he could make an amazing, I remember when he told me for the first time, I just met this baby octopus and he wanted to make this incredible film about this baby octopus. Um, so if it hadn't been for all three of our pushing and of course, Roger as well, who was doing um, a lot of the cinematography, if we hadn't done that, we couldn't have achieved what the film needed to achieve, which is create compassion for an animal that you would normally not look at twice. And the only way to create that compassion is because Craig loved that octopus and that octopus loved Craig in her own octopus way. You know, that's not, it's not a scientifically accurate thing to say, so I have to say in her own octopus way. But there was a special relationship and they, they interacted in a way that, um, makes people, and that's what people say to me as well. They say, you know, I watch the film and I, I actually look at birds in my garden a different way. Or I think Pippa, you and, and Swati were getting letters from people as well saying, I'm experiencing my dog or my cat in a very different way. Don't you think that that's what emotional ecology is? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, being a conservation journalist for almost 20 years, um, and as Pippa knows this, and, and Ellen having produced so many films, she knows this as well. You, 
you for, to get people to understand, and especially on the news, as I was doing news, um, you want to take very, very important issues and you want to put it out there because you want people to know about them. You want to know you want you want to inform people about climate change. You want to inform people about species loss. You want to inform people about ecosystems that are being degraded. Um, and you're doing all of these stories and they're really important. But in the news space, in the conservation space, for a large part, you're doing these stories as, oh, my God, this place is collapsing or that place is um, ruined or this damage is happening here. And these are the services that this ecosystem provides for us as humans. So therefore we must go out and save it. So it's very transactional at a level. Not that it isn't important, that it isn't beautiful and that natural history isn't incredibly important. It is. But I think where this film stepped into a space uh, that's been really interesting for all of us is that it's taken it beyond that transactional to purely telling you that you are nature yourself. You are a wild animal yourself on this planet and that these ecosystems and these natural spaces around you isn't something you go to, it is your home. And it is that recognition, I think, that Pippa brought so beautifully into the film, um, you know, with the way she saw the story that I think that was very, very important that it flowed in that way. So that's why we didn't say anything overtly in the film about do this to save that, or this is dying, or that's happening. It's purely, this is, this is a love story and it's symbolic of the basic love that we all need to have for this planet because it's our only home. You know, so I think that's where the emotional ecology part of it comes in. And that's the power of storytelling. And I think that's really where the conservation conversation needs to go now, uh, because we've tried the other side and we've not really succeeded too well. Pippa? Yeah, I, th I think um, I kind of grew up in a generation where even from when I was young, I was feeling afraid about the environment. Um, so it's, it's been something that, that I've worried about since I was a child. Um, and I think I just got to a point where I was frustrated that that was the only story out there about people's relationship with nature. Um, and I spent all this time working with and talking to and visiting these amazing scientists all over the world. And I could see that the, the way that they were engaging with nature, the reason for engaging with nature was a very, very emotional thing. You know, they were, they, were, they were driven by love, as you said, but they didn't, they, they were afraid to talk about it in that way. And what was so special about this film is it was an opportunity to really explore, as you said, a non-transactional relationship with the natural world and also a story of hope because it's scary when every single film that you see about the environment um, leaves you feeling like there's nothing we can do and it's all gone too far and all human beings do is destroy things. Uh, yeah, so that's that's why I made this film, and that was, you know, when when Craig first told me the story, that's really what struck with me. It's a celebration of awe for the natural world, mm -hmm. and a and an aspect of the natural world that we're not used to mm -hmm. uh, falling in love with. You know, we all yeah. love <laughs> elephants, you know, and the, <laughs> and the chimpanzees, the warm and fuzzy and cute, and we can relate, but. An octopus is a really unique creature, you know. I um, I learned so much. I had no idea they were so intelligent, and I'm sure most people don't know that much about an octopus. I mean, why would we, right? Um, and thank you just for bringing that to the the public and in the way you did. It's it's so much more effective than the preachy, um, you know, scoldy kind of environmental documentary that we need, but. Yeah, feel so good. Yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, Karen, no one has ever been converted by a pie chart, right? <laughs> so we, of course, we've been in this industry, in the film industry for a long time, but we have watched the chart films and the graph films come and go and the numbers fly around your ears. And at this time, you know, we have about 10 years to turn this around. Otherwise, we're going to have... Um, uh, a, a temperature rise that will have a horrible effect on life on earth. They've had letters for people, for people that, that really said it was personally transformational and because it was personally transformational, it, you know, it had a great effect on their community as well. And I, and I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying about uh, 
representing an animal that the people don't normally think of emotionally, I suppose. And what I've learned uh, in the last five years of spending so much time out in nature is that pretty much every single animal you meet, even if it's something very, very simple, like a limpet, which just looks like a shell sh stuck to a rock, has an incredible life. And that life is full of drama and the things that it's trying to achieve and predators that it's trying to avoid. And it's got to find food and it's got to find a mate. Uh, and it goes through all these different phases of its life. And, and every single creature is fascinating and has a personality. And yeah, that was a really profound realization for me during this process. I, and I also think it's it was a film that, um, you know, you, you there, there have been many films on wonderful animals. There've even been many films on wonderful relationship with animals, but most of those relationships have been mammal to mammal, you know, we being a mammal and having a relationship with a mammal. So to have uh, the experience that Craig did with an invertebrate, a mollusk really that's lost its shell is pretty incredible. But interestingly enough, um, octopuses, because of the way that they are and their intelligence, um, way back in 1990, uh, many countries actually made it illegal to do scientific um, experiments on them because of just how um, um, intelligent they are. Like for example, the UK, uh, some of the countries in Europe actually said you couldn't do scientific ex experiments on octopus. So that's been known for a while, but I think for most people, the ocean is still a massive mystery. You know, it's it's almost, I mean, there's a famous saying, I don't know how accurate it is, but more people, we know more as humanity about outer space than we know about the ocean on our planet. You know, this, this wonderful wild ecosystem that covers over 70% of our planet and is responsible for over you know, close to 70% of the oxygen that we all breathe. Um, and we know so little uh, about it. And so I think having that relationship, if that story could appeal, not just to people who love nature, because if you love nature, you're going to watch, you know, wallpaper footage with beautiful music, you're going to watch animals because you, you buy it, you're already there, you love it. How do you get to an audience that may not have that same kind of love, but may come at it completely differently for, in, for whatever reasons in different ways. So I think having Craig in that story and telling it in that way made that very important. Um, you know, it could bring in an audience that may perhaps wouldn't normally sit through and watch a natural history film because they came at it for various other reasons. So I think all of that came together uh, to give this film also maybe the year that it came out in with COVID, you know, with all of us locked down and locked away from each other without contact and to see a film that showed so much you know, um, togetherness in a sense at a time when we all felt so alone, I suppose, also made um, a big difference. Did any of you get a chance to meet the octopus? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible at cold water. That's why these two, these two uh, women really go in. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I did. Uh, <laughs> but at the time that I got to meet her just twice, um, I, I wasn't, as Pippa knows, um, I, I was very scared of water. I nearly drowned as a child and I had a major problem with being in the water and it took me a long time. And thanks to Craig and Pippa and everyone on the Sea Change team that now I, I go in every day. But at the time um, when I did meet the octopus, you know, I was in my full wetsuit, a life vest, snorkel. I mean, I was kitted out like I was going to outer space. And so I just sort of hovered on the top of the uh, ocean clinging to kelp. And I kind of like just saw her, saw where she was, kind of just got an introduction from Craig on who this octopus was that he was, you know, so just so absolutely enamored by. And it was it was lovely. It, yeah. So I, I did. I did get to see her uh, <laughs> briefly. Um, yeah. Pippa, you you did a lot of the underwater photography as well, which was really uh, beautiful. Can you talk to us about the challenges of shooting down there? Yeah, it's, I mean, the first big challenge is the ocean's completely unpredictable. Um, you know, and, and when you want big, epic underwater shots, you want good visibility. And those, those really amazing days, you probably get five or six in a, in a whole year. But of course, the incredible advantage of making a film on your doorstep is if you want that shot of Craig this big swimming in a big undersea forest that's that big, you just watch the waves that weather, 
and look out the window and you just wait. And when that day comes, you, you, you die for two and a half hours until you're so cold, you can't talk or carry the camera anymore. Um, and you get everything that you can. So that was the one thing. Sometimes the water is very, very rough. Um, and some of the shots we needed, we shot in rough water um, and, and I shot those. And then we had to wait for other days where we could, where the sea was rough, but it wasn't windy so that we could fly the drone. Um, and then Craig made things even more challenging because he wanted the film to be totally immersive and experiential in terms of how we made it as well. So whenever he and I went out, we didn't wear wetsuits and we didn't use scuba gear. So most of what you see is filmed that way, apart from the stuff that, that his good friend Roger filmed um, at different phases. That's, that's amazing. And, you know, it says in the description that you were shooting in an icy kelp forest, but you never see Craig wearing lots of clothes and the sun is beautiful and everyone, you hear Africa and you think it's warm, but you know, thanks for reiterating that it's, it's freezing down there. <laughs> it, it can be very cold. And in summer, it warms up a bit, but winter's icy. Yeah, icy. Yeah, and when the visibility is good, that's when the water is at its absolute coldest as well. Yeah, it's true. So you guys had like thousands of hours. What is it? Over 8,000 hours of footage to, to wrangle. Um, can you talk about the artistic challenges you had in, in shaping a story? With that much footage? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what's so amazing about editing, and, and I'm sure you relate, is that there are always so many stories that you can tell. Um, and there's a, a magical process that happens with cinematography, but then editing is this incredible alchemy where you really get to figure out what your narrative is and, and, and what your emotional arc is as well. And we started out with a story that was very broad because you're trying to crush uh, 48 years of human life and an entire year of octopus life into 90 minutes. So you start off with, with many, many threads that you want to bring to, together and actually quite a complex backstory. As you can hear, we had, we had we cut sequences about diving with crocodiles. We cut sequences about mental health. We cut longer sequences about the, 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 the San Bushman. Um, sequences about Craig's childhood. Also the pajama and, shark. Yeah, we have <laughs> so sequences. many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, many, many more sequences with Craig's son as well. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes it's very difficult to make those decisions. Uh, but once we got into the octopus story, it actually became really easy because she was so captivating. Her life was so compelling that the, the things that you see are so compelling. Um, and it's actually a really beautiful narrative to work with is, is, is one year in the life of an animal from her time as a young creature to the, the bittersweet ending at the end of the film. Uh, so yeah, that, that really flowed. There was a lot of debate about the end in the beginning. I mean, I think we cut that 50 times. That was difficult. And that was, you know, all of us had to put our heads together. Uh, Ellen and me sat going through that cut over and over again. Swati came in and watched it with Craig and I at different points and, uh, and then that was really when we, by the time we got to the end of the process, we were also in the weeds at that point that that was when Jinx Godfrey, uh, our, our edit consultant came in and, and you really, we needed someone who was very objective to just quietly help me kill my babies, I guess. <laughs> and that, <laughs> it was very painful. <laughs> yeah. I think it's always a challenge when, yeah. as you, we've already spoken about, Ellen, Pippa, and I, you know, it wasn't just a film. We were also so close to Craig and we kind of like knew everything. Plus we were, we knew the environment, we knew the water, we knew the story, we knew the footage. So it, it puts you too close to something because then everything appeals to you. Everything is important. Everything is because you've had those experiences or you've been with the person who's had those experiences. So everything speaks to you. But that's the, I guess, as Pippa said, the beauty of it is picking that thread that will speak to everybody, not just the stuff that speaks to you. And it becomes like this very still, it would have still been a beautiful, but it would have been a very esoteric little film that would have been eccentric and not had the broad appeal that it did. And I think um, um, Ellen most certainly saw that before we did. And then 
Pippa and Ellen um, decided that they needed maybe, you know, someone who could step back and look at it. And then that's how James came in. And he helped with that slight distance because he had no background with any of this. So he could do that interview with Craig, which we could have done, but we would have probably taken the rest of the year to do it. Or we actually couldn't have done it. I don't we, think. We could, we could I never don't think. Done it. We could have never done it. So I think only, only James could have done it. <laughs> Yeah, we, we we decided very consciously we decided yeah. on a on a man um yeah. who lived in great britain and and who um i i'd watched his film rise of the warrior apes and it it has this very um very robust kind of interview style in it and i thought oh wow we could really use that and we would never have the guts to go that far with craig ourselves because he's our friend we could never get him that far but but we brought james in who um interviewed craig i think for four or five days literally relentlessly didn't he he just pushed and pushed and he's unbelievable at asking questions and so you just ask the question ask the question and he just got this fantastic interview out of Craig and um, our exec producer, uh, Sarah Edelson, also did some of the interviewing, but I, I thought it was really good that uh, the three of us said right away, someone needs to come in and do that. Um, and it did give this, this robust backbone to the film in the end. Yeah, it was a beautiful frame to hang it on. And it also, you know, it lent such an air of, um, you know, vulnerability and you know, authenticity. And it was just very, you know, um, heartwarming to see that tender side of a man um, bonding with this little underwater creature um, and tackling his own demons. I, I think you hit the absolute right note. Just enough background in the story. I loved it. I thought it was really beautiful. Um, so, and, but it's kind of a departure from a lot of how you guys work. You guys are journalists where, you know, it's less observational, I would think, and more, you know, Swati, you were a researcher and, and, you know, you guys come from different disciplines around filmmaking. Can you tell me like the challenges of leaving that kind of journalistic reporter side behind in, in doing something? so uh, unique and observational? Yeah, um, it, it's interesting that you asked that because Craig and I made a film almost 10 years ago now. Um, and in that, funnily enough, although I'd spent time with the character in my film who was an animal communicator and I totally, before I completed the film, totally bought into it and knew what was happening, I still placed myself in the film as the journalist asking the skeptical questions. Um, and that's how I did the film. You know, I was asking the questions that the audience might have in their heads when someone says they can talk to animals. People are going to be like, what does she mean? How can she do this? All of that. So obviously, when, when this film was happening as well, I know what Craig was going through because I was living here with him. And I know how authentic his experiences were in the water with that octopus. And I know what he was coming back with every day with that little camera. And he'd show me the photographs and the footage and all of it. Um, because at that time, it wasn't even a film. It, he wasn't doing this to make a film. It was just an experience that he was having. So we weren't even discussing things as, oh, you know, this is going to be a film. He would just come back home after a dive and show me what he saw and how he felt and talk, talk to me about it. And so obviously when initially that idea like sort of even came up that perhaps this could be a film, I just knew to be very honest that I couldn't make that film with him because it, it was a... It, I, I'd seen what he'd been through and I'd seen what he'd gone through. And as a husband and wife, I mean, I don't know how many of you work with your partners, but there's certain films and certain ways that certain things happen in an organic way that I, it's, it's harder, at least I, I believe it would have been very difficult for the two of us to do the kind of work that he and Pippa did together, you know, to spend that kind of day in and day out four years, pretty much morning, noon and night, they sat um, on the edit machine, they were out in the ocean, they were doing it together, they were looking at the footage, it just, it's something I couldn't have done. Plus, it wouldn't have been as authentic, because at the time, as I said, I wasn't comfortable in the water. And then 
it was fantastic to have Ellen, you know, such a good friend who, who was also part of all those conversations Craig would have even before it became a firm. And it was in talking to Ellen then from that other side of it and not just being personal with me that the thread of the story came through and then, oh, it could be a film. And then thank God, like we found Pippa because I, you know, it, it would have, yeah, it, it would have been difficult for me to step in and do that. I'm just more used to obviously doing stories on subjects who are not my partner <laughs> just you know yeah this is just how it works yeah I think with regards to the kind of storytelling approach and and coming from a journalistic point of view uh absolutely this is a film that is not told through facts and figures um and I think I had a bit of an epiphany uh, early on in my in my journalistic career where uh, I saw something, it was uh, a little film about neuropsychologists and, and people had asked them uh, how much of human decision-making uh, comes from the conscious mind. And all of these psych uh, neuropsychologists drew little tiny shapes on an A4 piece of paper. And, and I just kind of realized that sci as scientists and journalists, we put all of these, all of this information out in the world and we appeal to people's logical decision making um but if we're mostly processing on a subliminal level then surely that's what we should be speaking to if we really want to open people's hearts and minds um so yeah that's why we, we this, this film took a like a very emotional approach and and i'm glad that we did that and it was also it's kind of a relief when you've been relying on facts your whole career to give yourself the freedom to do that. Yeah, I, I concur. Uh, I could talk to you guys for a long time about this wonderful film, but I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap that up. But I would just like to thank you all for gifting us with that beautiful story that informs the audiences about the beauty of the natural worlds in such an uplifting way. Um, thank you so much for that. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thank well, you. Thank you, Karen. See you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all for joining us.